Good evening, and welcome to UAS's Evening at Egan. My name is Angie Steves, and I work at the Chancellor's Office. This annual fall lecture series is free to the public and in live streamed throughout Southeast on youtube.com forward slash UAS Southeast. There are two ways that you can help fund this event. You can join the alumni and friends, friends of the Egan Library. They're on the rows of your, of your uh, chairs. And you can make a gift to the new UASAA, Friends of the Egan Library, Evening at Egan, a fund that we are working to endow. Membership and gift cards are in the front rows, are in each row of your chairs. You can find more information online at uas.alaska.edu forward slash Egan Lectures. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Bathrooms are located in the back and down the hall. The emergency exit is in the back to your left. And there are two handicapped spaces in the back on the side of the building. Please remember to turn your, or silence your phones and there will be time at the end of the program for questions. Please wait for me to bring you the microphone so our online friends can hear your question. And now please join me in welcoming Associate Vice Chancellor for Native Programs and Director of PETA's program, Ronelda Cadiente Brown, who will be introducing tonight's speaker. Thank you. Isn't that nice that they gave me a step up? <laughs> so, um, good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. This is the um, last event of the evening at Egan, and I so appreciate each of the speakers that we've had. There's been uh, rich presentations and, and um, broad audiences, and we so appreciate the support of this event. Um, t this evening, I have, in part, my um, PETA's hat on, the Preparing Indigenous Teachers and Administrators for Alaska Schools. We are in partnership with the Alaska Heritage Institute, and that rich partnership um, through a federal grant offers scholarships for students in the um, Alaska College of Education, and I'm privileged to um, oversee that program and that connection and welcome the many amazing students um, through our Alaska College of Education. Um, this evening, um, as part of that partnership, uh, we have training opportunities, and that includes evening at Egan and work with our faculty. I'm very pleased this evening to have the privilege of introducing um, Dr. Swapna Mukopadai. And um, she is not a stranger to Alaska or to Juneau. She has been here uh, previously, and this evening uh, we'll be sharing uh, part of the vast body of her work. Yesterday on uh, the Juneau afternoon with KTOO, she um, shared that math as a cult cultural construct, that everyone does math. And if you think about that, I imagine that we'll have some rich examples for how, how we look at the world, make sense of the world, and how mathematics is part of every culture um, throughout this wonderful world. So with that, please help me join and welcome um, Dr. Swapta. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Um, thank you for coming, and thank you for inviting me. Um, and it's a great honor to be standing and, uh, here in a land which is blessed by centuries of indigenous knowledge. And uh, uh, um, it's, it's a privilege to stand here and think about that as I talk about what I ethnomathematics today. Um, a few words about me. My name is Shopna, like shopping, very easy to remember. And uh, I live in Portland, Oregon. I taught at Portland State University. I'm retired now, but I'm still teaching. My husband says I failed 
Retirement 101. <laughs> uh, I'm from India originally, and uh, I speak and write two other Indian languages, and I uh, try, I'm, I go back there every year. Uh, I have collaboration there, and I also do uh, work anywhere I, I can. I, I, I love to do what I do, and I, I'll share some of that with you. So um, this is my opportunity for uh, tell, not just sharing with you, but also to turn you into thinking about mathematics differently. It's not that um, we have to sit and do calculus or do some uh, higher mathematics. It's about thinking how mathematics plays a role in our lives, and most often it is ignored or negated. And why is it that? And that's what uh, I, I hope to have a con conversation with you. And I'm, I'm really stressing on the word conversation because please have your questions ready for me. I usually have people interrupt me, but maybe that's not a good idea today. I have a lot of slides to share with you, but I would love to know your thoughts and your questions, and you can uh, definitely email me. So that's my email address, and I'm always on email. So if you send me your questions or comments or anything, uh, I will try to respond to you as fast as I can. I'm traveling next week, and I'm traveling back to India, and I will not have internet for a week, maybe at least. So give me a couple of weeks for getting back to email then. OK. So uh, when you hear the word mathematics, what comes to your mind? Think about it for a second, and then uh, talk to the person sitting next to you, and you know, just brainstorm. It's not a test, obviously. It's just a way to warm up our thoughts. Yeah. yeah. You know, what memories comes to you? What thoughts come to you? What images come to you? And you all should talk, you know? I make people talk. Okay, so uh, uh, hold on to, I think you are, you're warming up now, right? You're thinking about that. So let's see what we can do with that because we'll come back to this again. And so you will get a chance to have a bigger discussion then. So I'm going to show you some pictures and I would like you to think about, are these activities mathematical? And, uh, we will visit these. So can you see what they are? A group of women knitting, a very compli complicated lace pattern, a pair of socks, good for winter days. Somebody doing something on the ground, seems like writing, some kind of major construction, basket weaving, and two ladies playing. So are these mathematical, remotely mathematical? And, and, and it's, somebody would say, uh, a critique would say, you're setting it up. So people would obviously say, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but you know, th uh, interrogate the pictures. Think about them in isolation. The first one, for example, or uh, all of it, actually, for that matter. So now I'm going to put some propositions out for us to think about. Statement one is people create mathematics. And I'm going to share my favorite quote by Ruben Hirsch, a well-known mathematician. Mathematics must be understood as, as a human activity, a social phenomenon, part of human culture, historically evolved and intelligible only in a social context. Do you agree? Again, I'm setting you up, right? 
Okay, let's move to the next statement. Statement two, people from many cultures have contributed to the development of academic mathematics. What we call mathematics, academic mathematics, is not just Western mathematics alone. It has huge contribution from all over the world and sometimes not acknowledged. I'll show you a map. Uh, this is the math, uh, traveling of the knowledges, mathematical concepts and knowledges from across the world. You know, from China, from Persia, from India, from Iraq, from Egypt, coming to Cordoba, coming to Toledo. So you see the journey, right? And yet, the journey is incomplete in my mind, because what is left out is the contribution of the Aztecs. The Mayans are left out, Incas left out, Aztec is left out in this map. So this is something I am constantly interrogating. What do we have? What do we consider as knowledge? And is that a complete set? Who is left out, and why are they left out? So. Um, we're going to see a triangle of numbers. Many of you know what it is. I know, but hold on to it. So whose triangle is this? According to the history of mathematics, what I have read, uh, Halayudha in 10th century in India did some work on it. Uh, hold on, what's going on? Technology. Umar Khayyam the poet, philosopher, mathematician, around 1100. Yang Hui in China in 13th century. And Yang Hui's representation is here, which looks very much like what I have to the left. And this, this triangle is called Pascal's Triangle. From 60, which was done in 1653. My question is that, uh, of course, we did not have internet, so knowledge was not traveling fast enough, perhaps. But why do we not acknowledge these roots of mathematical knowledge from other cultures? Why can we not bring that to the forefront, give it to the people, the, uh, to confirm again that the diversity of knowledge, mathematics coming from different cultures, and, and to show that mathematics is actually human construction. Let me know if I'm talking too fast. So let's go to the statement three. People engage in global diversity of non-academic mathematical practices. So what could that be? Um, Oh, this is, do you know what this is? It's a kipu. Um, it's knotted strings, highly developed mathematics from South America. The kipus were knotted strings for re record keeping, statistical and narrative. For a long time, it was thought only that it, it recorded numbers, and I'm going to get to that. But in very recent uh, research is showing that in these knots were actually the language of writing. It was not writing in the sense we consider writing to be writing, but it was a recording of narratives. Um, if you get a chance to, I don't know if you can see it too well, uh, you will see the knots are at specific points on the string. So there, there are knots at the, towards the bottom of the string, a whole chain of knots, and then above, and then further above, almost to the end. So this is the positional notational system. So the lowest rank of the knots are the tens column, what we call zero to nine. Then are the tens, then hundreds columns, then thousands column, ten thousands columns. So uh, they did a lot of mathematics, st a lot of statistics in, in particular, record keeping of all kinds. They were obsessive about counting as one of the scholars, Marsha Asher, writes. Uh, but they did not have any so-called written record. And the conquistadores destroyed a lot of it. And they were forbidden to do, do the work. 
So I'm not going to get into that part uh, right now, but we can, if you want, we can revisit it later on. Uh, this is a picture that uh, was drawn by uh, an Inca, first Inca to write a book, over a thousand page long book called uh, The First New Chronicle and Good Government. It's a very uh, loose translation of the Spanish name. Uh, it's a chronicle of what happened when the uh, Spanish came to Peru. And he wrote it for the King of Spain and it was documenting the life there. And this th over thousand page book has more than 350 full page drawings like that, which is an illustration of the life there. So this is a picture of a man holding a kipu. The people who managed the kipu, uh, uh, kipus, there was a, a group of people who were trained to do that. They were like the accountants. They were the kipu keepers, kipu makers. So this man is holding a kipu, and kipus were records of various things like taxation, for example, census, how, how many people went to the war, how many died, all sad sorts of things. And to the right corner, to the left corner, you see a box kind of arrangement that's called upana. The, box, the uh, image on the top is an upana model and it's a counting board or an Inca abacus where they did computation of large numbers. Um, a couple of, uh, not a couple of years ago, maybe more than that, I had a student from Peru and she sent me an YouTube video. That's how in uh, Peru they are reviving these, their old knowledge that was shelved and put away and, and teaching the children how to do the computation using the Upana board. And, you know, I don't understand Spanish, so I just looked at the pictures and I marveled at it, but I cannot say anything more than that. So these are the things that completely get neglected or ignored from the mainstream mathematical mathematics classrooms. So let's think about what is ethnomathematics. Uh, and we will visit this idea of what is ethnomathematics um, with illustrations. But before we go to the illustrations, I think it will be a good idea to think about the basic premise, how the idea came about and how it, what it is and how it is uh, realized. Uviratan D'Ambrosio, he's a Brazilian scholar. He's 87 years old. And he started the movement called the program of uh, ethnomathematics. And it has really spread um, in many parts of the world, especially in Latin America, in parts of Africa. In Brazil, it's very strong program of reclaiming the knowledge that in colonization had otherwise suppressed it. So according to Viratan D'Ambrosio, it is the study of a cultural evolution of mankind in its widest sense, starting from the cultural dynamics that can be seen in mathematical manifestations. But it should not be mistaken for mathematics in an academic sense as a structured discipline. So it's not a precursor, it's not a replacement, it's a different ways of looking at it. So he also say, states that the mathematics practiced by cultural groups such as urban and rural communities, groups of workers, professional classes, children in a given age group, indigenous societies, and so many other groups that are identified by the objectives and traditions common to these groups. Also, what is in interesting to many of us who work in the realm of ethnomathematics, that most of these people who we study as ethnomathematicians, they do not have the formal knowledge of school mathematics. Or even if they have some school mathematics, they see it as a totally separate entity. It hasn't come to them as a, as a linked entities. So uh, as, you, as, you, as you may imagine, that ethnomathematics has uh, multiple dimensions. It has conceptual dimensions, historical dimensions, 
we saw the Incan work, that's a historical dimensions. Um, the use of kipu, um, it's pretty much gone from Latin America, except in some remote areas in Bolivia, apparently they have, they still use the kipus because it was forbidden for such a long time. It, it just was erased from people's thinking. So historical dimension is a part of ethnomathematics, the cognitive dimensions, definitely. How do people come up with alternative ways of doing things? It's a problem solving and problem posing. And how do people do these things? And, and how do people ch meet the challenges of everyday life? and how they use mathematical thinking as the primary tool for that. How do they communicate those ideas? So uh, if I want to present it schematically, I would say that cultural anthropology, cultural history, and what we call mathematics emerges out of uh, this intersection. It is not mathematics coming to it, it's mathematics emerging from that. And here, culture is, uh, uh, and taking Ubiratan D'Ambrosio's uh, concept of culture, it's very broadly speaking, it denotes a collection of myths, the values, the rules of behavior, the styles of knowledge, um, the ways of representations that's shared by the individuals living at a particular time and space. So the kipus, you and I have to learn to read Kipu as an outsider, but the indigenous, for the indigenous people in Peru, they had a very different take to that. They identified it differently. Now, two aspects of ethnomathematics that are, to me, very, very important and uh, is, uh, is the core belief of my uh, academic and existence that it acknowledges the non-academic mathematical practices. That when we consider mathematics, if I see somebody who hasn't been to school, cannot read or write, or failed mathematics, I think that person is non-mathematical. We, are, we, are, we tend to do it that way. Um, and this is, this is so well put together in this uh, statement by Paulo Freire. The intellectual activity of those without power is always characterized as non-intellectual. So uh, when we are not in the mainstream or when we are left out of the school, it's not that we are stupid. We do, we do things differently. And uh, this, so this is something that ethnomathematics really brings the dignity back in people's lives. Another aspect of mathematics is that it counters the dominant Eurocentric narrative of history of academic mathematics. That history of mathematics doesn't begin with Greece and stays uh, in Europe only. It has very alive roots in other parts of the world. So you can see that it has a political movement, actually. How do you bring back that? How do you recast your curriculum? How do you go about doing that? What do you lose and what do you gain by doing that? But it never is, it's not, ethnomathematics is not about replacing the mainstream uh, school mathematics completely. It's a, it's a, it provides a foundational work. How am I doing in time? Mm. Okay, I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to talk about some other aspects of uh, foundational work. And this is the work that Alan Bishop did called Mathematical Enculturation. And oops, I showed my quiz thing already. So his thesis is and, uh, that human activities um, is, is pan, and pan-cultural human activities are mathematical. And they could be classified as six primary domains. So what could be six human activities that are mathematical? Counting. Oh, you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Measuring, yeah. <laughs> Designing. 
locating. Now, in these days of GPS, we are forgetting locating is a mathematical activity. But uh, locating is a very strong mathematical activity. In fact, studies coming out that younger people who are uh, so used to GPS, their, uh, their senses of giving directions and directionality is compromised now. Um, playing? Who would say that, right? And it's not just chess alone. There are a lot of mathematics. The games actually have a lot, a lot of mathematics in it. And of course, explaining the ways of talking, ways of explaining what we are doing and not, etc. So I'm going to take one aspect of it, the designing, and focus on that, and um, give some illustrations of what I mean by ethnomathematics. And I'll give you some global examples. And I will also give some local examples. And then I will uh, see what I can do. So uh, Franz Boas, whose work has influenced me hugely, he said this. And you can read it. I don't have to read it for you, do we? That whole notion of we doodle, we decorate. No matter what, we decorate. And that's our signature, that's our ways of thinking. And that is a part of our human existence, pan-cultural again. So um, let's look at some examples. And the first example is, it is these are called Pojagi or Bojagi from South Korea. I'm sure it's also in North Korea, except that I have no ways to get that information. So uh, these are cloth coverings, uh, wrapping, um, used for giving gifts, giving food, keeping food for religious Buddhist purposes. And they're made by piecing smaller pieces of cloth. It's, uh, it's sort of like quilting. And these are both sides are the same. And, uh, and do I have to tell you this is mathematical? I mean, think about how mathematically designed the whole thing is, the tessellations of the whole, these pieces of text, this cloth. So this is an example that speaks volumes. Uh, the second example, this is called Kolam. This is from South India. You may have seen it. People uh, in the morning, women, in the morning at daybreak, they welcome the new day by drawing designs every day in front of the doorsteps. And um, they are very mathematical. Computer scientists have been studying these drawings. And I'm not going to get into the mathematics of it. I'm just going to show you. So this is done not as a mathematics, but as a religious ritual to welcome a good day to bring in a good luck for everyone. And it's rice powder dried, and that she's just dropping it by hand. And I have read and I have heard from women who do that, that, you know, it's the ants eat the rice powder. It's giving them some food as well. So it's sort of like edible art. Uh, if you uh, Google Colum, you can find lots of YouTube videos. And you'll see how it is done. And it's, it's fascinating how this is done. Similar to the column de uh, drawings, these are from Africa. It's called Sona. The singular is Lusona. And Chokwe and uh, tribes, and in Angola, Congo, Zambia, uh, uh, you see this as a ways of storytelling. It's a, it's a part of a game also. And, and these ideographs, these drawings, these ideographs are mnemonics to remember the stories. And uh, these, uh, uh, a scholar called Paulus Gerdes uh, from Mozambique, he has done a lot of work on uh, ethnomathematics. And he passed away recently. And he made a book on uh, Sona geometry for uh, children, young children, middle school children. And they're fascinating to think about and for kids to play. So by bringing these things, we are not just bringing mathematics to their lives, to their thinking. We are reinforcing mathematics is done by people everywhere. 
and it's identifying mathematics, not just in your textbook and your test, but in people's work. So again, if you, uh, thanks to YouTube, you can find good uh, small videos if you want to show it to others. This is my latest now ob obsession in a sense. The, the Shipibo Indians from Peru, Shipibo Konibo, uh, they, they make extremely complex drawings on two-dimensional and also on three-dimensional. So you see a pot on the corner, and these two are textiles. The drawings are similar, and I have read, and I have not seen it, I have not been there, that two women sitting on two opposite corners can start drawing, and they will get a neat at the center, and you will not know who is, whose work is which. And oftentimes, this comes with a it's, a, it's a, it's a healing art. There is a music that accompanies, and uh, they listen to the chant and the healing songs, and they draw these lines. These lines are on people's bodies, they're on the walls of the building. These are, again, uh, the forces of, uh, I guess, good wishes to surround us. That's what it is. And again, mathematically, if you sit and analyze, yeah, we can get into real depth. But if not anything, just look at how symmetric they are. I mean, all the designs I've shown you so far, except for the Bojagis, they're extremely symmetric drawings. And in these languages, there is no word for symmetry. No particular word for symmetry. No, that could be replaced by symmetry. Symmetry is, is conveyed in very many different ways. Balance comes most often. But uh, their work shows that symmetry lives well in their thinking, though. OK. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about clinket work. And I'm going to talk uh, about the basketry, the spruce root basketry that you are surrounded by, and, and the incredible mathematics that's in it. This is that old photo. You may have seen it. It's from the Library of Congress. It's, it's my favorite to see uh, the young three women weaving basket with a baby also there. Perhaps it's posed, but doesn't matter. It captures a lot. So this is something you all know, but you know, just to show that the top picture to the left is, a, is how twining is done. And um, because it's a complex thing to do, and it's not, uh, it looks simple, but it is not. And this is uh, how do you introduce a, co a different color number two, three subsequent colors. It's called false embroidery. It's not an embroidery. It's another kind of weaving that goes in opposition. So just to enrich our ways of, just to, just to make us aware of what it is in it. And also, I, uh, I like to remind myself that when you are weaving, or when you are knitting, you are doing one row at a time. Unlike drawing, you can draw it wherever you want to start. So when you are on row one, you really have to know what you want for your row six, row eight, etc. So you are projecting your thinking beyond what your first step is like. So you are continuously, this is a very cognitively complex task. So we just, you know, we cannot discount it as just weaving, weaving basket as a therapy. I know people used to make fun of it, right? Um, so this is the complexity. I'm trying to capture the complexity in one slide. I'm, I'm hoping I'm just reaching it to you. You can see what I'm talking about. Okay, here I'll just show some beautiful baskets. As you know, the baskets were of various sizes. Uh, they were utilitarian. They were not made for, initially, they were not made for tourists, but they for everyday use. It's women's work for everyday use, for food gathering and, and even cooking. These baskets were so tightly woven, they were watertight. And before the contacts, 
This was the cooking vessel. They were filled with fish and seaweed and what have you berries and heated rocks were put in it. So that's how food was cooked. You will find in museum a lot of uh, baskets that are so brittle because, because of the age of the baskets, that's one thing. But also when they're cooked, this is plant material. They decayed and fell apart rather quickly. So, uh, but they all have adornments and not just one little piece. They have complex patterns. And most of these baskets have three row, at least three rows of patterns. And uh, we can stand and do some mathematics of it. We can do some uh, transformational geometry and look at the symmetry properties. But I would rush through so that I can give you some examples and you can go to the museum or find these and think about what it is. Uh, what is also amazing as uh, ethnomathematicians talk about the inspiration for what you see on these baskets, these are abstraction of what women saw in the nature. Baskets were women's work. So the names are also reflection of that. For example, this basket that has stacked up parallelograms, it's called the leaves of fireweed. In fact, you know, we, if you take a look, look at the leaves of fireweed, which is now gone, uh, they look like stacked up parallelograms when you walk past them. So they have names like that. Um, and I'll just move on to, so these are the traditional baskets for berry picking, small baskets for children berry picking, medium sized baskets and large baskets where the, the berry collectives were collected. And uh, one of the good things with digitization, you can access the museum uh, collections most all over the world uh, online. So uh, these baskets, some of them are from Burke Museum in Seattle. That's from the uh, Museum of Natural History. So you can very easily see and look, look at the designs. And if you are knitting, I can see that you can pick up these knitting de des designs put on your knitting. So there are some more variations on uh, designs and the container shapes. So uh, the baskets had a, a flare. And I'm not going to go into it uh, because uh, the flare is, is for the shapes. OK, pause. No, go back. So uh, different shapes and containers started being produced after the contact because soon the uh, Europeans realized this is a prized object here, and there was a demand for the baskets. So the basketry teapot, for example, that doesn't serve as a teapot, but shows again the innovative spirit of the basket weavers. They took an example that they saw, that the, the foreigners brought in, and they rendered in their basketry, or the bottles, or different kinds of shapes of containers. So uh, let's move on to uh, other examples from Native Americans from other different parts of the country. Plains Indians, for example. Far flesh bags. Do you know far flesh bags? These are raw hide bags. They are like envelopes. Or like uh, Fred Meyer's brown paper bag. They could be folded down when you're not in use. And uh, rather simple in construction, one might say, but they're profound in, in terms of that ma the understanding of the relationship between the 2D and the 3D world. So look at the, again, the role of symmetry and adornment and nothing is simple. Um, I like to take my students to the museum to show these things, and I ask them to copy them. And that shows how complex they are. Even when you look at it, you know, trying to copy it, it takes us a long time 
to make these renditions look like what they are. Um, I'll show you uh, uh, hold on, yeah. So a rawhide that could be this is from Franz Boas's work. Um, he drew that if you take a rawhide and if you if you enlarge this piece and then follow the drawing and fold it appropriately, you'll get a box like that. And here is a box. So these are the things that shows that in the traditional, in the indigenous communities, there is so much mathematical knowledge. So why are the, why is it that our students who are not in main, uh, who are not doing well in mainstream schools, what is it that they cannot connect to? I want to get into another example very quickly. I showed you symmetry, mirror symmetry mostly so far. These are rotational symmetry from Southwest, from members. This is a vanished tribe. And uh, two-fold symmetry, three-fold symmetry, four-fold symmetry, three-fold symmetry, four-fold symmetry. There's seven-fold symmetry, which is so hard to draw. And their work is all about symmetry, but rotational symmetry. And my conjecture is that in Southwest, where there is not much water, they don't get to see the reflection like they see in Northwest. Having water all around, we see the reflection so much. That becomes a driving force in our cognitive schema to make the representations that way. Of course, I cannot prove or disprove. It's just my speculation about that. OK. So oh God, sorry. Very quickly, I showed you from various parts of the world some examples of ethnomathematics. And now I'm going to take a short detour and do my, show you some work that I'm currently doing in India. I'm studying boat builders. And these are the boats they make. These are deep sea fishing boats. They're 60 feet long, wooden boats made by hand. And uh, where is it done? Here is a map of India. And where this red arrow ends, it's the Bay of Bengal and the Delta. That's where a small village, I try to go and hang around with the boat builders to learn from them what they do. I call it vernacular engineering because it's an engineering they didn't learn from going to school. It's they learned it, they picked it up as their vernacular language. Most of them cannot read or write. They cannot sign a piece of paper. And there are no papers around what they do. So, you know, the boats are for fishing people. So this is a picture of what happens with the fishing dock. The fish comes and in a, in a lightning speed, they sort the fish by kind and by weight because it has to be shipped away. And it's, it's a warm country on ice so that fish is, remains fresh from the markets. So this is, sorting itself is a very mathematical activity. So you see that is happening. So this is the uh, beginning of the boat. The bending of the planks. How do the plank bend it? By tying ropes to a tree. A tree is an anchor and bending it. So the man who's doing that, who's checking on it, he's who, what I call the chief engineer. He's the head of the crew. And he's checking on the tension to make sure it's, it is doing what it is supposed to do. I'm rushing because I'm looking at the time. Um, so this is the part of the keel, the, the backbone of the boat. And uh, these men are deciding on the centering of it. So that piece of uh, rope or cord, it's a very important tool. It looks like a regular uh, rope, and uh, it is mentally calibrated. They use for measurement. It doesn't have any mark on it, but they know the markings and they're, uh, they're dividing it. So here they're using, this was the first time I saw them use a measurement, tool of measurement. And uh, 
but they set it aside and using a saw as well. So they use multiple different kinds of tools for getting the work done, not just one thing for one job, etc. So not limiting that way, which is again a cognitive challenge all the time. Uh, okay, so the keel part is attaching to the keel, some the, the top part of the keel. And that's a very complex geometry. They're attaching the two pieces uh, with a glue that's a homemade glue. It's not commercially produced. And something this has been happening for a long time. Oh, I forgot to tell you, boat building is a very old enterprise in India, but very little is written about it, almost none. There are examples you see in temples or in some paintings, but uh, the, the activity of boat building passes on, and it's not a static knowledge, body of knowledge. This engineering is not static. They adapt to what the demands of the culture is. So what it was in 15th century is not the same as in 21st century. Now they put in, they have to put in motors in it. So they have learned how to do that, how to accommodate that. They have to put in GPS, they have to put in wireless, otherwise the government wouldn't grant them a license. So they have learned how to use these things without the knowledge of reading manuals. They have no manuals there. There are no drawings there. In fact, uh, when I first saw them working, so this is, you see the join, joining there. And the work is done open air because they don't have a factory space. This is the dry season of the year. In December, January, they start the work. They must finish it by May because by then it is too hot. They cannot work. So again, the constraints are important things to remember. And constraints are everywhere we go. Uh, and constraints are how do people problem solve despite the constraints is something to think about. So this is the keel has been set. Okay. After the keel is set, uh, planks are put in one at a time. And planks are, you cannot put in a straight plank, plank on a plank because the boats are curved naturally. So uh, they have to be bent. How is it bent? Um, here the canoes are steam, right? Steam is used to open them up, the uh, wood. Here they're doing something similar. They are heating up straws and that heats up the plank. And they know when the, uh, by feel, by observation, when it is ready, and then there's brute force to bend it. So all of them pull it down. And I had been asking them, how do you know when to stop? Why did you not pull it for another five minutes? No, it wouldn't work. Why did you not pull it for less, less time? It wouldn't work. How do you know? And they have never articulated their work. So they say, you know it. Then they say, you feel it. So much is embodied. So much of the physics and the mathematics is, is in their body that the touches their observations tell us, which is different than doing a formula. Okay. Yes. So he's cutting notches uh, because the planks are, uh, these notched planks are, this is called reverse uh, uh, clinker method of joining the planks. So uh, they are equidistant apart and they're not drawn. He's just, again, it's, it's the embodied cognition. He uh, is, knows what he's doing. And it's only me who knows nothing ask those dumb questions. So I'm going to show you what kind of, and they are staple then. I, I brought a staple to show you what the staple is like. It's a very simple looking piece of metal. Can you all see it? You can see it later if you want. Um, and here is a picture of a young kid learning from a master how to staple it. So the hands are together. The staples are put in from the bottom and he's learning how to use a chisel and a hammer to bend it. 
and that is the way of joining. It's like stitching. It looks like a stitched uh, wood or stitched fabric for that matter. Um, so the flanks of wood are uh, stitched and they are also, uh, they're bent by, you know, uh, clamping the planks at different angles. Uh, you will see, uh, I'll show you another picture. Uh, the clamps and the rods are actually, and, and there, there are nails holding up the clamps. That determines the pressure there so that, again, nothing is written down. They feel it and they can say, yes, now it is done. And the pegs are, the clamp is taken out when the bent is uh, achieved. So this is what it looks like. See, this look, the staples look like stitched, it's called stitched boat. In some terminologies, they call it stitched boats. And the clamps are still on, and they're working on it at the same time. Uh, the work is always communal. People work together, everybody does everything, but they all have a favorite, and I'll tell you what their favorite is. So this is a, a, a boat is almost finished. It's a 60 feet long boat. The government taxes them if it is more, if it is 60 feet long. So they make it slightly smaller to avoid the taxing. So there's all sorts of ways they manage that. So this is the curvature of the boat. And I put it here because initially when I went to study these, I thought that this is where the innate understanding of uh, calculus comes from, the rate of change, the curve. So this is where I thought another place the thinking of uh, change comes from. But from so far, I haven't gotten that. They talk about it differently. They say that it is, you know, it's, it's not the geometry of it that guides our work, it's the measurement. It's a, it's a measurement of the pieces, layer by layer, almost like the weaving, one layer at a time. That's what is, it is. It is not the to total thing. You are looking at it totally. We also look at it as a total piece, but we also look at it as a single piece at a time, one at a time. So it's an algorithmic thinking that's very different. And I cannot get to their head yet. I hope I can get some glimpse this time. So. Uh, what you saw earlier is the hull of the hull of the boat, the body of the boat that was done. Now, in European context, they make the ribs first and then make the hull. In Asian context, from what I know about in India, of course, and also in Vietnam, they make the hull first and then they put the ribs in. So that is an interesting thing to think about. Why is it? And I can tell you more later. So the rib has to be made, how are the ribs made? And I was given an impression that they have templates. And I said, here is the formalism comes in. They have a template and template decides on the uh, design of it. And that's where the calculations are. So I have to watch it. So the wood came, the, uh, the planks came, it's a different wood. It's a hard wood for making the uh, uh, ribs. And these two men made a very crude template by joining some pieces and is crudely checking on the curvature. And when they were, he were, they were done, they just, you know, they threw that template for cooking, making fire for cooking. Um, they also use a rebar. They bent the rebar to make the template. And when that uh, design was done and it, when it worked, as you can see, he's, he's holding his hands down with that. Um, then he threw away the rebar. That became useless to them. So in other words, this is cognitive, from the perspective of cognitive thinking, cognitive uh, processing, tool use is very, very important. And this is what I complain about people using GPS or too much dependence on it. We are letting our mental tools uh, rest. They're not working when we are not using our own thinking. And this is incredible that these people are using the tool as a flexible adaptive instrument and they are not carrying it as a fixed object because they can create the tool anytime they need 
and it is what we call adaptive learning. They adapt to the context of it. So here is, uh, he's walking with his rebar, which he's going to throw away. As a contrast, I brought some pictures from uh, Finland, it's wood building. I had a collaboration with a Finnish group. And where the templates are done ahead of time, they're numbered, and you know which one goes to where. So it's pre-done, pre-formulated. And that's the difference between the ethnomathematical approach where it's done in the context to adapt what you have. Okay. Oh, I have only two minutes, it seems. Okay, I'll just quickly finish it. So the ribs are in, and um, this is what the boat looks like. There's a cabin made, and this is, the, again, the boat, this is the, uh, look of a 60 feet long boat, uh, not quite done, but there. And this man is making some designs. And this is something they all want to do, design. We are back to dec decorative decoration, decorative <laughs> impulse, what I call. That decoration is such a part of human thinking that designing is as a mathematical thing, thinking is revealed one more time. And look, can you see the symmetry na property or nature of the design here? Again, not drawn or anything. He's just chiseling away his merry way. So there are some homemade, oh, most tools are homemade. So these are, uh, you know, these people are refugees. They came, came from Bangladesh when it was East Pakistan. And they couldn't bring anything, but they brought the tools. Homemade tools. Um, this is all the tools they use. They're lately using some power tools, but they prefer using hand tools because that's what gives them the confidence, and that is a finesse. The fine work comes from hand tools. They have a better connection to that. So uh, I'm going to go back to where we started. Remember? Did you, are these people doing anything that is remotely mathematical? Are they? I mean, I was so tempted to pull out uh, that complex lace pattern and show it that that is nothing but an algorithm. Or knitting the socks, the heel of the socks, that's nothing but another kind of algorithm. Or designing the buildings, they are very complex mathematical thinking there, although it's a mathematics is not glaring, not shouting at us. It's there. So uh, I have two major thoughts I'm sharing with you, that what if the diversity within mathematics as discipline, mathematics in cultural practices, and mathematics in everyday life are reflected in diversity in mathematics education? Why can we not bring these to the classrooms? What would happen if we bring them? It will perhaps make the learners, and we all are learners, you know. Uh, I have some trauma in learning at school in mathematics in particular, things I was told to memorize, things like that. So the connections that it, uh, this approach, what it does, it establishes connection. It augments our sense of identity. It gives us confidence as learners. And we also, it, we also see that everybody does mathematics. It's not a select few. Uh, when I first came to this country, I was really sh shocked to hear so many women say, I cannot do mathematics. Almost with pride, I cannot do mathematics. Nobody said I cannot write. So why is that? Maybe that will take that away. If a woman could knit that shawl, that complex pattern, there is mathematics. Can we make those connections? It's sort of like a healing in that sense, cognitive healing, if that could be a word. So I'm working on those ideas, and how do we take it to my next conjecture? What if school mathematics were taught as a social discipline, 
embedded in historical, cultural, social, and political context, human context. If we teach mathematics as embedded into the lives of people, maybe it will be less traumatic and less alien. Uh, and these are foundational aspects. Then the formalism and abstraction will have a place to sit and anchor it better. And the balance of school mathematics has to shift to the criteria of relevance, usefulness, creativity, interest, critical disposition, which again augments the sense of agency. Um, the sense of disposition, sense of agency and critical disposition are very fundamental because we take it for granted. We just swallow what is given to us unquestioning. So when can we use mathematics as our own personal tools for questioning the world we live in? I'm going to finish it here. And I did not write a slide saying thank you. I'm just going to say thank you to you. Thank you. So if I made any mistakes, I apologize ahead of time. And if you have any questions and comments, please, I think if you could stay a little, right? Yes. Hi there. I'll Hi. ask a question. Thank you for your talk. My name is Anjay. I'm a math professor here at UAS. Uh -huh. And um, I've been asked by the local high schools here. They're uh, trying to develop an ethno-math class. Uh -huh. And um, they're always looking for ideas of things they could incorporate into that class. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering what sort of mathematical ideas you would recommend to incorporate in such a class? Thank you. Um, OK, this is a great question. One thing, you can, you can approach it in so many different ways. If you, you know, remember the slide I show about six human activities that are pan-cultural? Counting, locating, playing, etc. That is what I call the curriculum of life. You can use that as a curriculum organizer. And design curriculum that could be culturally connecting. For example, counting in different cultures. And uh, uh, Indo-European, many Indo-European languages, and base 10, 10 is 10, and 11 is 11, 12 is 12. But in certain lang cultures, the number words are not the same that way. Uh, 11 is 10 plus 1, 11, 12 is 10 plus 2. So by the, the name of it, you know how the numbers came into action. Um, there are other languages, especially indigenous languages, where a base 5 uh, and base 6, all different ways of nomenclature. This is enriching that num counting words are not just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. There are different ways of thinking about the numbers. There's a great book called uh, Number Words, Number Symbols by Carl Menninger. Um, so that's one example. Geometry, geometry is, a, is, a, is a very interesting place to bring mathematics of uh, work. And construction and design all come together there. You know, I, I often do the paper bags, like grocery bags. In India, you can get small bags this big for buying one egg versus this big reinforced newspaper bags for buying five kilograms of sugar, for example. So how are they made? They are made by people, and you take them up on the seams, and you look at the design of it, and you, you remake it or make it in a different shape and different size, not a different shape, different size. So th those are the things where you can connect to ethnomathematics. Uh, lots of games. There are lots of uh, uh, examples of using games uh, as a way to think about mathematics. Um, locating, there are, you know, uh, map reading, lo uh, indigenous map making. And, and map making is in all over the world. Um, so that sort of, uh, these are just, I'm, I'm throwing some random examples. 
Um, did you take my email down? Maybe we can talk if you're interested further. And I can shoot some examples to you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to comment on that. Last year, uh, when we organized Tlet Yao, our One Canoe Conference, uh, there was a professor of ethnomathematics, Linda Furuto. And uh -huh. yeah, she was saying, so I would recommend that you talk to the indigenous people and their way of living and how uh -huh. they incorporated life. Uh -huh. So in her way, it was using teaching trigonometry using celestial navigation or in frequency with animal sounds. So I think the indigenous people of this land would have wealthy of knowledge that's relevant to the culture here. Thank you. Thank you for that pointer. Uh, Linda's work is very important. Uh, Jerry Lipka in Fairbanks has done fantastic curriculum, six volumes of Math and Cultural Con Context, MCC. And he worked for 20 plus years uh, with the elders, the UPIC elders, so he created culturally relevant mathematics. You can take a look at them, especially the navigation part is very, very interesting in that. And there are also uh, work on navigation uh, in the Solomon Islands. There's a book called East is a Big Bird, how the uh, Micronesia, how they navigate by star watching and also by their very simple looking instruments that do the job. So there are, yeah, there are some stuff and it's very fascinating. No comments? Any suggestions to me? Did I go too fast? Okay. Thank you for coming. Gunal Chish, and with great appreciation uh, for your inspiring talk and um, um, encouraging us to think beyond the parameters that we often operate. Um, I would also like to acknowledge this evening uh, Gloria and your team for um, your expertise in, in helping uh, connect uh, with our media um, to make these evenings possible. We appreciate your time and expertise. And then um, I, I failed to, to acknowledge um, Chancellor Caulfield and appreciate um, his um, ever learning and, and challenging thought um, on the Juno campus and um, Sitkin Ketchikan and appreciate um, your support of this evening as well. Um, we uh, just drive safely and thank you so much for spending the evening with us and thank you again. Another round of applause, please, for our guest speaker.